John was a rocker right from the get-go, and he was in uh, uh, a band called the Chord Lords, and in 1962, 61, 62, and he never was uh, from the folk scene. Almost everybody else in the scene, uh, Kantner, Garcia, David Freiberg, uh, uh, the sort of the rudiments of all of the bands uh, in the Bay Area really came from the folk music scene. And uh, they were all like sort of uh, children of the Kingston Trio. And uh, so uh, um, the uh, actual hard rockers, or the rock, not the, the rockers, were Link Ray and those kind of people who inspired people like like John, and that's who he really was uh, enamored of, and, and probably who was a model for him. So John was an honest, legitimate rock and roll guitar player, and then he got involved with the, the folkies, and and it became what they call and still call folk rock, which was a, a a kind of a moniker that always didn't seem to express very much, but it's, it's like, a, like a dumb bumper sticker. It seems like it makes sense until you think about it. And then, it doesn't, then you realize it doesn't make any sense at all. What did he, in your mind, what did he bring and how did he influence cats, folkies like Garcia and, 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 and Freiburg and those cats? What did he bring that helped, you know? I think for one of them was the, the knowledge of how to, what an guitar, electric guitar should sound like. Uh, mm, the, mm. the whole concept of a twang and, and all that, and, and feeding back your amp and, and all of that stuff. John played a guitar that you used to be able to buy for, I think it was like $78 in the silver, the Sears catalog. It was called a Dan Electro. And it was like a beginner, I guess you'd call it a beginner guitar, it was a mail order guitar, and it had really cheap pickups and it was made of, of, of this kind of particle board called Masonite. And uh, it was really the, of the bottom rung of the guitar ladders. But it became famous because its sound was so bad that it was good. I did. And uh, it became... You called them bat twin, right? Well, they had kind of bat wings on them, although John was really... For some reason, John had... Some, John was, was, was uh, fascinated by... Um, um, a Dracula, uh, and then what's his name? Uh, what's Dracula's real name? Uh, uh, I can't say it right now. Anyway, um, um, the fangs. Uh, the, the... So, so he he everything was like sort of bat bat wings for him, and bat this and bat that. And I guess he probably would have been a Batman fan had he have been born later. Um, uh, although there were Batman comics in those days, but but, but the the whole Batman craze and movies and stuff came after that at his time. But uh, for some reason, he liked that. Uh, it, uh, he also he, he liked the kind of Dracula. Uh, 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 he I guess he liked the clothing. He liked the long he had long stringy hair, and he was skinny as a beanpole, and he always dressed in black. And uh, and his clothes were always like thin and long hanging, and and he loved that whole look. He kind of cultivated that look, and along with that, he always had a low slung guitar. He was also instead of his guitar, like I play with my guitar practically up under my chin because I feel like. I can control it better, but he's one of those guys that had it way down there. I never could understand it, but it's like anything else. If it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So he had, when you put that long stringy hair and his dark complexion and, and his clothing and the low slung guitar with the, the, with the bat wings on the end of it, um, uh, he, it really made an image and it created a whole version of a, a persona that, that kind of became the style of, of some of, of many players, and, and there's many, many, many young guitarists follow in the footsteps of the fabulous, incredible John Cipollina. He, you know, did you know him? What was he? What was where was he at at the end of his life? It seemed to me that uh, cats like Bloomfield and 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 Cipollina and John, uh, not John Con's a bad example, but those cats. I don't know, man. I, could you explain his mental frame and where well, he was? One thing uh, you should understand that John's uh, John lost his life to a childhood disease, 
Uh, he wasn't. He, he didn't OD. He wasn't a junkie, and mm-hmm. he wasn't necessarily particularly a druggie of any particular kind, any more than any of the rest of us. So, which means that probably fewer than twenty or thirty dump trucks of cocaine were snorted during our lifetimes. But um, um, he had a. a, 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 a he was born with a, with a, a DNA situation that had a lung problem. He had his twin sister. She had problems too all of their life, and she now passed on that as well. But um, he amounted to mesothelioma, is what he died. Mm-hmm. And um, he, it was something that that he was always what we all we call him a lunger. I mean, he was always he was always that kind of uh, not too healthy. He was the skinny kid in class that was always sick. Well, Mario was saying he was like he had black lung on a on a on a houseboat, and, and uh, he would die. He was like in really bad shape uh, for yeah, a while. He was he he battled that kind of stuff his whole life. But as far as him, his personality, and as far as who he was as a, as a man, John was just a regular everyday guy. I mean, he to me was well for one thing, he was near and dear to me, and so I saw him as a as a really close friend, mm-hmm. someone I loved. Um, but he, but as far as being um, Particularly uh, eccentric or any of that, I, I can't say that that he was was unless I guess I didn't notice that his penchant for Dracula type stuff. So I guess you could say he might have been a little bit obscure in that area. But I didn't really see him that way because on a day to day basis, he was just an everyday guy. You know, and he was he loved to play. He loved music. He knew the kind of music he wanted. He 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 knew what he wanted it to sound like and that was something that very few of us really knew when most of us started uh, um, they most of us came from either folk or, or some kind of, of, of big band background I grew up in a big band family my mom was a, as I, I've said this before but my mom was a fantastic musician she always had uh, small orchestras that rehearsed in our living room she played in nightclubs and stuff like that my dad it was a great uh, he considered himself an amateur or non professional musician, but he was a great player. And uh, their music style was the music of the 30s and 40s and what would, it would be known as, or called euphemistically as big band music. But a lot of people came from the country and, and hillbilly background. A lot of people came from the folk music background. And, and the folk music was kind of a... Um, Inspired in, to my generation by the Kingston Trio, the Kingston Trio, Dave Gard, one of the things that he did was uh, he was really interested in world music. They were, the Kingston Trio was the first people that ever really delved into world music. Now it's real popular, a lot of people do it now, but back in those days, that was considered really stretching out, and he got a lot of flack for it because it was a little bit outside of the ordinary. But he traveled the world and looking for, in fact, he's you know, he spent most of the rest of his life, the last half of his life, in foreign countries studying um, world music, and he brought it back. You look at all the Kingston Trio songs, they, uh, most of them are based on some foreign land. So, were they incorporating that kind of uh, percussion into the music, per se, or the, just, I mean, I think it was really the storytelling part that the, that the Kingston Trio was really that, that made it the folk music thing. So the conversation. Yeah, I guess you would say that, or the message, the, the lyric, the lyrical message. The lyrical message. And, and uh, because they were all stories of, of folk tales, but they were folk tales from other than America, from all foreign lands and stuff. And so with a, a, when. Uh, my generation sort of got out of high school or was finishing high school and getting, finishing college and so on and so forth. Um, we, we picked up guitars having listened to people like the Kingston Trio when we were in, in, in younger years. And so we began, well, we also grew up on, on people like Fats Domino and Chuck Berry and that sort of generation of, of 50s rock and roll. So the, the combination of folk music was really um, uh, uh, kind of country music and rock and roll, and, and with with a, a, a great flavor of world music kind of thrown into it, and that is my definition of, of sort of folk rock. That's why I say folk rock doesn't really mean have a meaning because it doesn't really doesn't really explain what I just sort of ran down. Yeah, but yeah, but. It, it, it.